it again. Um, we the people, which is the uh, preamble to our constitution. We the people has two dimensions. Of course, as, so, as long as we bring people together, conflict will ensue. It's inevitable. We can't avoid it. Even if they are the same religion, they will create other four lines of difference. That's what has happened to Somalia. Somalia and the land of the Muslim, that country has collapsed. Has not been able to come together as a country and as a nation, in spite of being one language, being one religion, being one culture. So as we put people together, regardless of whether it is multi ethnic or even homogeneous, conflict will come. That's the first sociological fact that all of us will accept. And then when we bring people together, you, know, you have to then work at different levels to ensure that people can coexist among us. The first level is the constitutional and the legal framework that spells out the rights of people, that spells out the structure of governance, that spells out uh, the duties and responsibilities, the restraints, the you know what is what is permitted, what is forbidden, what and so on and so forth. That's the legal framework, and that's what the uh, scholar we are dealing with today is addressing. How do we create a better legal framework in Nigeria that enhances that facilitates peaceful coexistence among the diverse and the only in this country. Of course, we the people also have the second dimension. Not every relationship among us is, uh, is governed by law. We relate as human beings at the personal level. We relate as members of different groups in society and uh, so on and so forth. And that dimension is governed by our norms, what we believe, what we think, what we accept. The values, the norms that regulate our everyday conduct and our everyday relationship and interactions with one another. I salute the kind of the courage of uh, Kajit in uh, taking on this very difficult assignment. The topic is extremely apt, it's topical, it's relevant, and it's, it's something that confronts all of us. And it's something that confronts not just Nigeria, but actually every African country. Africa being the most diversified continent of the world. Partly because of the very fact that this is a continent where human beings originated and have lived the longest. And Africa has therefore undergone the form of the type of you know, social evolution and cultural differentiation which no other continent in the world has undergone. And so we are the most diverse and the most uh, you know heterogeneous societies that you can find on earth. And so it's a problem that virtually every African country faces. In adopting the cognitive approach, you know, one thing that must be understood, and I want the candidate to understand very clearly, is that the moment you mention cognitive, you are talking about people's minds, people's mindsets, people's experiences, and so on. And cognitive justice is, how do we harvest 
the ideas, the norms, the beliefs, the values, the attitudes of the people in such a way that it forms the raw material for building your legal and constitutional framework. In other words, if the legal framework flows from the people's mindsets, from the people's norms, from their values, then chances are that the legal framework will accord with their existential realities and it will be easier for them to conform with the legal framework, to respect it, to understand it, to appreciate it, and to make it part of their own everyday uh, structure of behavior and uh, so on. It is in that respect that I agree entirely with the postulations of the candidate. Of course, the issue of cognitive justice is a boundary concept that stands on the boundary between law and other disciplines, particularly sociology and anthropology, cultural anthropology, particularly the democracy. It's also a boundary concept that also stands in, you know, between law and history. So naturally you find the candidate making reference to issues that are historical in nature, because you can't talk about the people 